Welcome everyone to Beyond Monitoring, the rise of data observability, um, a trend that has taken the data industry by storm uh, over the last few years. Um, and excited to welcome you all today to talk about the evolution of the data observability industry and um, some specific examples of what it looks like in action. So just a little bit about myself, or before actually about myself, I'd love to get to know folks in the audience a little bit. Um, so maybe we could do something like raise your hand if you're a software engineer. About a third or so. Raise your hand if you're a data engineer. Same group. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're a data scientist. Okay. Um, data analyst. Just a few, few proud. Um, how about data executive, chief data officer? Interesting, yeah, very cool. Well, awesome to see this, um, this variety today. Um, maybe to ask you all a question, um, whatever, whatever profession you have, has it ever happened to you that you've woken up in the morning, on a Monday morning, or perhaps even worse, this is on a Friday afternoon, right before you're heading out for your weekend, and suddenly the data product that you're responsible for, maybe that's a dashboard that you owe an answer for, or maybe it's a machine learning model, something just looks wrong in the data. And you start freaking out, and you're like, oh my god, the data looks wrong. How, how many here have uh, experienced it by raise of hands? about 80% or so. Um, so obviously this problem sort of crosses industries, crosses professions. Um, it's something that's like very well understood and kind of really um, felt, uh, very um, extremely felt. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about that problem today and some approaches to solving it. Um, so by way of introduction, my name is Bar Moses. I'm the CEO of co-founder of Monte Carlo. Uh, we're honored to be pioneering the data observability category alongside hundreds of customers and the, some of the best data teams who are um, <clears throat> taking the next step in data observability and um, uh, eliminating the situation that hopefully everyone here um, uh, will no longer feel in, in the future. Um, just a little bit about myself, I'm a big action movies fan. Uh, Bruce Willis is my favorite, but I've also yet to see Top Gun, which is on my list. Um, so if anyone here has seen it, <laughs> I heard it's good, uh, but I still, still need to Still need to catch that. So let me start by putting a little bit more um, context around the problem here. <clears throat> the problem that I just described and that everyone here across sort of professions feels is a problem that we coined or sort of termed data downtime, which is basically periods of time when data is wrong, inaccurate, or erroneous. Um, and really happens to everyone. It happens to everyone from different flavors. So as you see in the slide here, um, some folks upstream might make changes to the data and can't really see downstream and might make changes that uh, down the line uh, create data problems and they're not even aware of that. On the other hand, some people um, are, might be data consumers who don't actually know when the data is bad, don't actually know who to ask for help. And it might be um, you know, data that your marketing team is using, data that you're reporting to, to the street, data that you're using um, uh, to feed your machine learning models, your recommendation algorithms, um, whatever data product you may be using, you actually might not be aware of the implications of, of bad data. And so the, the idea, um, the, the, the idea or kind of the problem of data downtime has been, has been around for um, more than a decade by now. And really anyone who's worked with data experienced something like this. The problem that happened, kind of what sort of exacerbated in the last decade or so, is that so many more people use data, so much more data is available, and the reliance on data is now table stakes. And so if 10 years ago the data was a little bit wrong in some areas, you could kind of pretend like it's not a big deal. Uh, maybe no one noticed, uh, maybe it was just you and a friend on a Friday afternoon, um, but today you really can't sort of count on that. And the implication of bad data really sort of um, go across, uh, uh, across teams and organizations. And so the way that most of those issues are detected today, 90% of them are actually someone downstream says, hey, the data looks wrong. This is the most common scenario that we hear from folks. There are some um, kind of um, sort of initial uh, efforts, if you will, around co uh, code base detection with manual tests that folks actually can put together. Um, but at the end, the result is that it might be days, weeks, or even months um, until a data problem actually is detected. And as I mentioned, in the past, this 
problem has existed everywhere, but probably didn't have really any dire implications on businesses. Today, that just, that's not the case. Um, if in the past there were only a handful of people using data for a, for a use case that wasn't that relevant or wasn't um, maybe as kind of core, today that's just not the case. Um, a recent example, actually, that you're welcome to read about um, is the company uh, Unity, um, which is actually a gaming company. And due to a problem with, uh, with ad data, there was actually a loss of $100 million because of one data problem. That was just something that was published in the news a couple weeks ago. But as you can imagine, every single company that is plagued by bad data feels this viscerally um, and actually experiences this, both in revenue loss, in loss of customer trust, in loss of um, data engineering, data analysts, and data scientists' time that is wasted. There is some good news. I also come bearing some good news. Um, and the good news is that there are some common patterns and there is some um, shared, shared suffering, if you will, around this. Um, so, you know, I'll take you fast forward, uh, or sorry, I'll take you backward about three years ago, before we actually started Monte Carlo, um, we interviewed several hundred data people, um, whether those be um, an engineer, head of engineering, head of data, there weren't that many head of data at the time, um, machine learning engineer, just hundreds of people, and ask them, what's keeping you up at night? What's the number one problem that's keeping you up? Uh, unbiased. And this problem of data downtime came up again and again and again. And in different formats, it, wasn't, it didn't always sound the same, but the core problem was the same. Um, and actually what we did is we spent time with those several hundred people and collected a database. Um, and actually there are several of those folks here in the audience, which we owe a lot for, a lot to, so thank you for, for letting us spend time with you and for helping us create this category. Um, and actually created this, um, uh, this library, if you will, of all the reasons for why data went wrong. Um, and all the ways in which folks dealt with it and all the ways in which folks resolved those issues. And clear patterns emerged. And the interesting thing is that a lot of folks said, hey, you're not gonna find patterns in, in this kind of data um, because every, every company's data is different and there can be a million different reasons for why data goes wrong. And actually, in fact, what we're finding is that um, similar to concepts from software engineering, there are actually patterns. Um, and the questions do sound the same and they sound like what you're seeing here in the slide. Folks ask themselves, why is this value so high? Why are there so many nulls? I expected only 1% null, suddenly there's 90% null. Um, if I make this schema change, what reports, what BI reports downstream will be impacted? Those questions came up again and again. And so that gave us a clue or gave us kind of signals that there actually could be um, uh, a way to address this problem in a way that wasn't possible before. Enter data observability. Uh, so what is data observability? Data observability is based on concepts from software engineering, the concept of application and infrastructure observability, which is a very well understood um, concept. There's um, many companies out there that help engineering teams make sure that their applications and infrastructure is reliable. Um, companies such as um, AppDynamics, New Relic, Splunk, Datadog, um, and others. And today, it really is kind of crazy to imagine that you would have any sort of engineering endeavor without something like observability. You would, you know, your CTO would think you're nuts to do something like that. Um, however, it's actually very commonplace for a data team to be shipping data products on the regular without having a way to make sure that that data is actually reliable um, and accurate, which seems a little nuts. And so if you take kind of the concepts from application observability um, uh, over here, uh, nicely turned by Cindy, um, and actually apply them to data, what does that look like? And so if you actually think about, the, or we like to think about this in kind of three core principles, um, or three core steps, in the reliability life cycle, which is around discovery of problems, resolution of problems, and prevention of problems. Again, this isn't new. Uh, it's concepts that we have adopted from DevOps and now introducing them into data ops. But what does it actually mean? It's very high level. You know, we kind of understand, okay, we need to detect a problem, we need to resolve a problem, then we need to prevent the problem from, from happening to begin with. Um, but what does that actually mean? 
So to break this down a little bit, um, these are some examples of what constitutes in each of these steps. Um, I will walk you through it at high level, kind of what these are with some customer examples. Um, and then we actually have another session tomorrow to go in more depth into what this is like in Databricks specifically. But just to kind of introduce some of the concepts here, the notion that the data team is the last to know about data problems is unacceptable. It's just a reality that we can no longer live in. And so the goal of the detection pillar is for the data teams to be the first to know about data problems. I don't think I've heard any data leader or data person who wouldn't want that in, as, part of their, uh, as part of their workflow. It's actually a reality that we can and should get to. We're not there yet, <laughs> we have a ways to go, uh, but it is something that we should get to. Um, the second concept around resolution, I hear oftentimes from data teams spending weeks, months, sometimes longer resolving data issues. That's unacceptable as well. There are actually solutions that we can build in order to help data teams understand faster what's the root cause of problems. Perhaps not solve it immediately, but aid and, and assist in the process of understanding the root cause. And then finally, what we're seeing is that actually by introducing the right operational rigor and operational tools, it's actually possible to prevent these data downtime issues to begin with. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some examples of these. What I'll do is actually double click into the detection, um, the detection pillar first and then walk through the others. At the base of these kind of um, uh, three pillars is, or sorry, three steps is what we call the data observability pillars. And these data observability pillars are pillars that we've constructed based on those hundreds of conversations that we've had with data leaders asking them about their data breaking and how. And so we've come to the conclusion that by having strong um, observability and strong automation of these five pillars, you're actually able to gain trust in your data. Doesn't mean that your data will be always right. In fact, that's probably not gonna happen. Uh, but you will be able to um, address it in, in, a better, um, in a better manner. And so let's talk, about, let's talk through these five observability pillars. <clears throat> the first pillar of data observability is freshness. And so what you see in this example, a little bit hard to see, but what you see here is um, a table that gets updated periodically. Um, and then at a certain point, that table actually um, stops, stops receiving data. Uh, and so an example for this, or kind of a um, you know, specific customer uh, example is actually, um, I'll share an anecdote about Vimeo. I don't know if you're familiar with Vimeo. It's a video, um, video platform, content platform. Um, they have 200 million users. Um, and quite a sizable data engineering team. Uh, I think they process billions of streaming events daily. Um, and for them, knowing that the data is actually arriving on time means that they can make decisions on the appropriate bandwidth for a specific user, making sure they have the right quality of video at the right time. Um, and actually monitoring or understanding the freshness of data for hundreds of sources was just impossible for their data team. And so by automating um, coverage across hundreds, hundreds of thousands of tables, they were able to um, gain a stronger understanding of when data is arriving on time and when it isn't, and are able to take action on it. Another example is distribution, or this, the second uh, pillar is distribution. In this case, well, distribution at a high level is um, kind of everything at the field level, if you will. So questions around why is the, why is the value here too high or too low? Um, are there negative values that I don't expect? In this particular example, you can see um, there's a particular uh, anomaly that's, detect that's detected in terms of um, percentage, of, uh, percentage of null values. Um, and you can see also at the top right here that this is marked as key assets. One of the most important things that um, data teams need at a certain point is understanding what assets are important and what are not. There's hundreds of thousands of tables potentially and recognizing what are the ones that are uh, key or kind of tables uh, most important um, for consumers is actually incredibly hard, especially when you have a team of um, you know, more than three to four people, figuring out who's using what data for which becomes incredibly difficult. And even more so, understanding what you need to monitor and at what level of rigor becomes really hard. And so developing um, automatic ways to identify key assets and then prioritizing those um, anomalies or prioritizing those incidents so that we're able to detect or so we're able to, to address those first um, is key. Um, just an example, uh, I'll actually give an example for volume. 
Uh, the third uh, pillar is around volume. So as you can see here, there's a table that's consistently updated over time, consistently added in terms of number of rows, um, and then suddenly the number of rows drops in a way that could be normal or not. Um, I'll give a specific um, example, JetBlue. If anyone here flies JetBlue, uh, JetBlue is very data-driven, uh, and <clears throat> they use data to support a couple of use cases. One is their, um, their support team, and the second is, is operational. So there's actually um, uh, uh, data that you know, powers and tracks all of your flights. And so if data is partial or doesn't arrive, that could mean one of us missing a flight. Or it could mean one of us missing our, um, uh, our next flight, our connection. Uh, it could mean our suitcase not arriving on time. Uh, all of those are real implications and kind of real, real experiences of what happens when the data just doesn't arrive. The fourth pillar is schema. So schema is one of the most common culprits, and oftentimes culprits of bad of data downtime. And one of the most important um, kind of things to know about schema is it actually has to do a lot with sort of a miscommunication between teams. Oftentimes one team will make a schema change and the, isn't, the, the other one isn't aware of it. Uh, and actually just streamlining the process of knowing what schema updates were made is incredibly helpful um, and brings a lot of clarity to teams. It's not that easy to automate often, um, but definitely introduces an additional level of transparency and visibility. So here you can see a couple of um, fields that were added and, and changed in type. And the last pillar is lineage, um, both field and, and table level lineage. And one of the most important things about lineage is that it actually, um, well, there are two, component, two core components. One is um, it's incredibly value in conjunction with, with um, information about the health of the data. So knowing that something is broken, a particular table, let's say there's a freshness problem in a particular table, but there are literally no downstream dependencies on that table. Perhaps it doesn't matter, right? Perhaps you don't even need to know about that. Um, and vice versa, if there's a particular table that has a freshness problem, and we now know it's upstream sources, we can use that as a way to try to figure out root cause analysis, um, try to understand what are some of the um, upstream culprits that may have contributed to, to this particular freshness problem. So lineage, you know, I, I always say this, like lineage by itself is quite useless, to be honest. I don't know, I'm sorry if there's any lineage fans out there, sorry to offend you, um, uh, but it is actually quite useless. Um, I think it's helpful in combination which, with information that actually allows data teams to take action. I think one of the biggest problems with this space in general and kind of with all of this is that a lot of it can be just information for the sake of information and you know, just kind of bombarding your team with alerts or information about stuff that doesn't matter, honestly, can often cause even more, even more data downtime um, and even more trouble. And so a lot of the work in data observability is actually making sure that the information that we surface the data team is actually valuable and actionable. Um, and that means being really thoughtful about what information gets to what team and at what time. So for example, if there's a particular alert about the table, the, the table here in the middle, who are the teams that need to know about that? And how fast do they get that alert? And what kind of information do you surface when you share that alert? And so actually getting pretty sophisticated with sort of alert, routing notification, adding context, adding metadata, adding queries, all that information can help make um, data observability so much more powerful and not just you know, lineage or anomaly detection for the sake of it. So this is the dream scenario. Um, uh, and we've actually seen data teams make strong strides towards this. Um, I had the great fortune of talking to, um, I was, I was you know, just uh, kind of touring now that like the world is opening up and able to meet folks in person, had about 30 or so conversations just in the last week, and it's just um, uh, stunning and remarkable to me to see data teams who've actually strongly adopted data observability and the results that they're able to see. Um, it's really heartwarming, I have to say. Uh, some of them actually you know, are, are able to, to change the way that they um, think about data downtime and also change the way that they're perceived in the organization. If in the past, oftentimes data teams were sort of blamed for data being wrong or there was a lot of finger pointing and now they have ownership on those problems and they can take the first steps. Um, in this you know, um, 
scenario, the idea is that about 80% of those incidents can actually be detected in an automated way. Some of them which with um, uh, sort of fully automation, and some of them partly automated. Um, uh, the, the large majority, the 70% here refers to kind of fully, fully automated um, with the first three pillars. And then we do actually see data teams after they start with the first 70% add an additional level of custom, customized um, detection, uh, which is powered by helping data teams identify what are the key assets onto which they'd want to add that additional level of monitoring. So that kind of increases the coverage. And then there's always going to be 10%. I will add another 1% there that's not on the slide. That is, there is a 1% of data problems that will still be caught uh, by a downstream consumer that's really upset and pissed off on a Friday night. Friday night. I think that's still 1% happens. Um, but the large majority um, can be covered. So he talked about the first pillar um, of detection. Uh, I'll talk just briefly about the second and third resolution and prevention, mostly because I think the industry really is at the first, um, at the first pillar. There's a lot of work still to do to make sure that we are detecting those, uh, detecting those incidents and being the first to know about it. Um, when it comes to detection, one of the sort of key um, sort of you know, uh, metrics to look at is, is time to detection. So how quickly does the data team know about an issue? And resolution, we talked about um, uh, time to resolution. So how do we decrease from months to minutes or hours? And in this case in particular, there's kind of a couple, um, couple things that we're seeing emerging. One is um, basically triaging incidents by understanding kind of the, the radius of impact for a particular um, incident. So we talked about, you know, understanding that there's uh, about 149, in this particular example, this alert has 149 reports that actually rely on that. Um, you know, if those 149 reports are actually used by key people in the organization, you probably want to know about that. Oftentimes, these reports are used by customers, uh, which you probably want to know about even more. <clears throat> and then the last part here um, around prevention, this is a little bit of a busy, busy slide, but I'll talk about um, the idea of prevention. I think a lot of the things that folks have done um, in data historically has been very manual. And one of the, pro or the key um, uh, foundational ideas of data observability is introducing a lot of automation. And by introducing that automation, it doesn't mean that we're replacing the data team, not at all. It just means that there's a lot of stuff that's been done manually uh, that we can assist in doing. And in that process, there's actually a lot of insights that you can glean about, about operational insights. So you can glean about the data system and about the data infrastructure. And so there are teams, um, House Call Pro, for an example, that actually use some of these insights and reports on a weekly basis to make sure the health of their data infrastructure and data system um, is actually improving week over week. So just to give you an example, you can actually look at key insights or analysis, which kind, what kind of um, data sources break the most? What sort of data teams struggle the most with, um, with data issues? Um, across the organizations, which data uh, downstream consumers report the most problems and have re-improved over time? So actually just those, anal just those insights can be really helpful. Um, one of the things, um, uh, kind of one of a, uh, one of our customers actually uses the metric of um, what percentage of um, alerts or incidents are the data teams engaged with. Um, some, some customers have, you know, obviously 100% um, engagement, and that means that every single incident is actually triage resolved um, and uh, is actually incentivizing their data teams to do it in record time. So there's actually sort of a weekly um, uh, competition, if you will, uh, of the data team on kind of who is building the healthiest pipelines um, over time, which I thought was pretty neat. Um, the other thing that's you know, possible to do in a pretty easy way, given that the information is already there, is um, table cleanup suggestions. Um, so how do we actually help uh, data teams make sure that they're using data that's actually being used, uh, that, that's not um, costly from a processing perspective? Um, so all of these insights are, are things that can be used um, operationally on a week-by-week -week basis to, to improve the health of, of our data. These are some results uh, that folks have um, reported. Um, I'll, I won't spend too much time on this, but the, the goal is um, detection, resolution, and prevention. Um, if you're not measuring them today, I'd be curious why not. Um, and what does it take to start measuring that? 
Um, how quickly does your data team actually um, it becomes aware about becomes aware of, of data issues? How quick are they to resolve them? And can you actually reduce the over, overall number of data incidents? I'll talk about um, a specific, another specific example. So Fox, uh, which uh, I assume you all are familiar with, um, they cover uh, the election as well as upcoming Super Bowl, uh, which I hope everyone is excited about. Um, and as part of that, they monitor things like number of users, um, number of devices being used, minutes, uh, minutes viewed. Um, obviously, those go into some oper operational decisions, but also into um, Looker dashboards that their executives look at um, on a daily basis. Um, and so, obviously, you can you can imagine what the what the stakes are, what the implications are when that data is wrong. Um, and so, actually, Fox has adopted. Um, uh, data observability as a means to make data self-serve and as a means to make data available to many more teams in the organization. Um, this is quite, quite uh, you know, th something that we're seeing in media as more and more media organizations adopt data um, and sort of you know, go through this digital transformation. Um, and it's been impressive to see Fox accelerate the adoption of data um, with, uh, with self-service. Um, Fox also actually yeah, they have two, 200 different uh, data sources that get updated several times per day. Um, and so understanding um, what data breaks and when and also routing that to, to the right team um, is a key focus area, has been a key focus area for the Fox data team uh, this past year. And just one more example, ThreadUp, um, who I believe might be in, in uh, the conference today. Um, Satish, if you're here, hi. Um, uh, so ThreadUp is, is an online um, thrift store and uh, cons consignment store. And um, the problem that the ThreadUp team uh, encountered, which is a problem that many data teams encountered, is you know, a team that has um, a, lot of, a lot of people that have changed or a lot of people that joined and then, and then left. And obviously, that sort of natural transition. And um, the data team at ThreadUp needed to understand not only the quality of the data, but also the structure of the data. Um, and so with data observability, actually we're able to understand what data sources are being used, where, by who, and what's the quality of them. Um, and that basically uh, brought the, the peace of mind and also um, kind of supported the move to, to Data Lake House um, uh, as, as Databricks users. I think I'm gonna skip this slide. Um, for more kind of information on, on Databricks, um, uh, there's a talk tomorrow uh, at 12.30 um, walking through how exactly um, we've implemented this uh, for data observability use cases and Databricks in particular. Uh, so recommend checking that out. Thank you so much.